Ocean Hills at its best is when we are in it together. I gotta get it together for a minute. That just rocked me. Oh, whew. Was not expecting that this morning. Sometimes God just gets a hold of you. Thank you, team, for that. Thanks for that gift. Uh, I said I wasn't going to cry in my message today, too. <laughs> so starting off that way, you know, that's good. Um, uh, well, what a, what a powerful time to just come together and sing and hope you're able to enter into God's presence and his love. And we, we really set apart this time to be sacred, to be a time where you can connect with the creator of the universe, the creator of this world. And so we hope you, you take this seriously and you come and, and enter in and, and just get rid of distractions and um, hopefully you're able to do that. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's appropriate that, that we begin this morning by, by fearing the Lord, by respecting and revering and being in awe that he knows us, that we're safe and warm in his arms, that he knows us through and through. That, that is so appropriate that we begin. That's, that's why we sing these songs together, because we, we lift that up. And, and that's the beginning. As we seek wisdom, we start with fearing the Lord. So we're here to, we're here to seek wisdom. And, and our, our, we're continuing in this series called Stop Doing Dumb Things. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a series on Proverbs that has been great to go through. I don't know if you've been tracking with us, been going through maybe a chapter a day with us, but John and I recently were able to sit down and do some long-term big picture planning for this coming year, and uh, we had a great time just dreaming about what God wants for this church and thinking about our emphases and what this year has for us, and, and I'm just super excited about what we mapped out, and we had to stop and have a little fun along the way, so I don't know if you saw us tooling around Santa Barbara at all, but two pastors on a scooter is seriously, uh, we, had, we had a little fun there. Um, and this morning, what we're talking about this morning, we're talking about parenting. So Westmont, you came at the perfect time. Thanks for being here for this. No, there, if you're not a parent this morning, I just want you to hear, there is a word here for you too. So so stay with me, and, and God has got a word planned for you because his word never returns void. It always bears fruit. So listen for that word this morning. But today we're going we're gonna to zoom in, we're going to focus in, and we're going to be looking at, at parenting. And what does Proverbs say about parenting? If you remember from week one, wisdom is the ability to make great decisions. The ability to make great decisions. And I thought before I had kids, I had to make a lot of decisions. And then I had kids, and the hundreds of decision, decisions you have to make every single hour blow you away, don't they? I mean, it is just decision after decision. So I know I need wisdom as a parent. I need it. Morality is not enough to raise my kids. Knowledge is not enough to raise my kids. I could read every parenting book in the whole world. It's not enough. I need wisdom that comes from God and comes from his word. And, and parenting advice, isn't it such a touchy subject, parenting advice? You just hear that word, someone tries to give you parenting advice. It, it's never really received that well, is it? And there's so many voices, so many conflicting things about parenting. Do I sleep train? Do I not sleep train? Do I spank? Do I not spank? Do I use a pacifier? Do I not use a pacifier? We got to get them reading by this age. You got to get them in sports by this age, music at this age. There's so many things to think about, and, and your head really starts spinning around. It starts spinning, and you start getting this, I don't know about you, but I, even this week, as I was reading through parenting books, I just started getting this, this burden on me, just placed on my back. This is a big job. Oh my gosh, I can't do this. I can't do this job, it's too big for me. You know, and you feel the pressure mounting. And, and I don't want you to feel that today. I don't want you to go through that. I went through that this week and, and processed that with my wife a little bit. And um, I just, how I got over it was I just honed in on God's word and said, God, I want your voice 
to be the loudest. I want your voice to be the loudest in my life and in my parenting. And so, I, as I turn to Proverbs, I read through um, Proverbs, the whole book at the beginning of the week with the lens of parenting. And it, it's such a fascinating thing to do, to, to read through a book of scripture just with a, with a certain focus and a certain lens. And uh, so I want you to grab your Bibles, encourage you to bring these on Sunday uh, together so you can get used to them, so you can be familiar with them, go back and read them maybe later. Um, and I began reading through the whole book, and, and as I did, I saw three uh, essential ideas that came out for me. And, and so, the, you know, there's so much I could talk about this morning with parenting, but I, I just want to talk about the three main ideas I saw come out of Proverbs. And, and they are this, diligence, discipline, and integrity. Diligence, discipline, and integrity. If you're taking notes on the back, there's a little outline. You can, we have some fill in the blanks this morning, so you can fill those in. Diligence, discipline, integrity. So let's start with diligence. Proverbs was written as a manual for young Hebrew men. If we remember that, Proverbs is written as a manual for young Hebrew men. So in a sense, Proverbs is a parenting manual. It's a, it's a book that tells us what our kids need to know. And as you look through the first, even the first beginning of each chapter, just follow along with me, starting with chapter 2. My son, if you accept my words, if you store up my commands. My son, don't forget my teaching in the beginning of chapter 3, but keep my commands in your heart. Chapter 4, listen, my son, to a father's instruction. Pay attention. Gain understanding. Chapter 5, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Chapter 7, my son, keep my words. Store up my commands within you. It sounds like a broken record, right? And, and a lot of parents, we feel that way, don't we? Listen up, pay attention, listen to what I'm telling you. Can you hear me? How many times have you said that in the last week? And as, as a parent, this is an age-old problem, getting the attention of our kids. And what we see, I think, from this pattern is we see that the parenting takes diligence. It takes a persistence that we need to keep going. We need to keep moving. We need to keep encouraging. We need to keep teaching, keep instructing. It's a daily, minutely, hourly, you know, whatever you want to say, it's, it's, a, it's diligence. We need to keep going as parents. And sometimes we get lazy. I know, I know just, I have three kids, eight, six, and three. And um, we just, you just get lazy. You get tired at the end of the day and you're, you're tired of parenting. And it's easy to, to just want to stop and and want to parent out of um, only when your kids irritate you, you know? And then when they don't irritate you, you're not really parenting. I don't know if you felt that before, but that, that's what happens. We, we just get tired. And so diligence, I think I see in the book of Proverbs, this theme of diligence throughout the whole thing. The, the job of the parent is to be diligent in parenting, in loving, in teaching, instructing. Being a parent can be, can be so romanticized, can it? I, it, can be, it can feel like from the outside it's always cute Instagrams and precious moments. And uh, those of us who are parents know the truth, though. We know that behind every Instagram there's a hundred moments of messy, frustrating, exhausting things that happened, you know. And, and that's, that is just what it's like. It is hard work to be a parent. Could I get an Amen. Amen by myself, as uh, Sherwood Carthen would say, one of our covenant brothers. Um, but it is hard work to parent, so we must be persistent. We must be diligent. My son, my daughter, listen, pay attention. Don't forsake my teaching. Let me turn to Deuteronomy really quick. This is our theme passage for our family ministry, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. It says, hear, O Israel... And whenever you hear Israel in the, New in the Old Testament, you can just put in God's people there. You can even put your name in there. Hear, O Israel, God's people, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. 
impress them on your children. That your there is not just specifically to a family. It is our community. Your children, the children that all came up here are your children. If you're a part of this community, impress them on your children. And listen to this. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them on, as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I think what I, what I hear here in this passage and why I want to bring this up is, is that diligence is found in the mundane moments of life. Listen to what we're supposed to do. Talk about God and what he said when you sit at home, when you lie down, when you get up. Life is created in the mundane. It's not created in the grand moments of life. And as a parent, I had to ask myself, do I take those mundane moments for granted? Do I capitalize on those mundane moments that God gives me in my house as I walk along the road or drive somewhere? Am I, am I talking about God? Am I bringing him up? Am I bringing him into conversations at bedtime, in the morning, at breakfast. It takes diligence to do this. It takes diligence to bring God into the mundane. But it is what we're called to do, parents. How about when you sit at home? You might think, I, I never actually sit at home because I'm always doing something. Um, are you making it a priority, though, listen to this, to eat dinner together this school year? I want to challenge you in your thinking Maybe you can get together with your spouse later and just talk about that. How do, we, how do we be more intentional about our dinner time? Listen to these statistics. The average parent spends 38 minutes per week in meaningful conversation with their children. Family dinners are more important than play, story time, and other family events in the development of vocabulary of younger children. Frequent family meals are associated with a lower risk of smoking, drinking, using drugs, a lower incidence of depressive symptoms, suicidal thoughts. They're associated with better grades in 11 to 18 year olds. Listen to this, adolescent girls who have frequent family meals and positive atmosphere during those meals are less likely to have eating disorders. Kids who eat most often with their parents are 40% more likely to say they get mainly A's and B's in schools than kids who have two or fewer dinners a week. You think the mundane moments are worth considering, listening to those statistics? God has set it up this way. Life is built in the mundane, and it takes diligence to bring him into that. And just as God walks with us every moment, he walks with us in the mundaneness of life, we're called to walk with our kids in those moments and to, to think about how we can bring him into it. How can we help them see him in all things? That is where life happens. So that's the first essential. The second is, the second essential of godly parenting would be discipline. It's a big word, discipline. Proverbs 29, 17 says, discipline your children and they will give you peace of mind and make your heart glad. I think we all want that, don't we? A peace of mind and to make our heart glad. Almost every time, as I was reading Proverbs, almost every single time the Proverbs gives direct parenting advice, it has to do with dis discipline, this word of discipline. It's a scary word for some of us. We have, we have maybe bad connotations with discipline in, in the family we grew up in, or maybe we grew up with no discipline. Discipline is, is crucial, and, and Proverbs makes that really clear. And there's so many parenting experts on different sides of how do I discipline. And so I'm, I'm not here to, to argue for a specific methodology of discipline today. That's not, that's not the point of this. But I, I think I want to give you some general biblical thoughts on discipline and then just give you some characteristics that I saw as I read through Proverbs about what godly discipline entails. What does it look like to discipline someone in a godly way? Discipline is, is vastly different than punishment. 
The focus of discipline is not to punish, but it's to correct. It's to create boundaries so that you can set your child on a better chorus. Discipline is to be done out of love. It's not, it's not an expression of revenge. It's an expression of love. And it's not putting our kids in their place, but it's about rescuing them. We see over and over in Proverbs, it's about rescuing them from the path of danger. There's a, a story Philip Yancey talks about, and he, he was on an African safari he saw a, a mama giraffe taking care of her offspring. And shortly after this, this little baby giraffe was born, she went over and she kicked her offspring. She kicked her baby giraffe hard. I don't know if you've ever seen a giraffe kick. It's a scary thing. I mean, their legs are long. They got serious leverage. And it looked like she was really hurting her baby. It looked like it. And then she did it again. And each time... The giraffe would get up on his wobbly legs and try to walk, and still she continued kicking him. And finally, he got up pretty rapidly and ran away from her kicks. Phil turned to his guide and said, why does the mother giraffe do that? Gosh. And the guide said, the only defense the giraffe has is its ability to get up quickly and to run from its predator. If it can't do that, it will soon die. And Yancey said that while it looked like a cruel thing the giraffe was doing, it was the most loving thing that mother could do for the giraffe. Sometimes discipline is the same, isn't it? It looks cruel. It, it feels cruel in our hearts. But if we do it out of love and out of the heart God wants us to, to have, it's the most loving thing we can do for our kids. My, my small example this week was just with, with Kira, my youngest, three years old, and she has been using her pacifier. She's been really attached to it, and we know it's time to give it up, and we have to direct her to do that. It, it's not good for her to keep having it. And so we, we just we started talking about, your pacifier's going to break, and we're really sorry, but it's not good for you anymore. And so we, <laughs> we ended up breaking it. It didn't just break. We cut it, you know. So we, we, we cut the... It's, you know, my wife's great idea. It was awesome. Um, we cut the, the pacifier, and then we give it to her, and we, we just say, this is it, you know? We kind of have a little just moment there, and she flipped out. <laughs> she did not want us to do that. She, she knew it was coming, but she just freaked, and you know, everything from get out of my room, I don't want to talk to you. And, and as a parent, you're like, oh, this is so cruel. Why am I doing this? And then you have to remember, that it's because I love her. It's because I know what's best for her. It's because God's given me the authority in her life to, to show her and direct her the best way to live. And I know as she gets older, it's not going to be a pacifier. It's going to be many other things where I'm tempted just to be her friend. But God's called me to be her parent. So four things, real quick. I want to blast through these while I have time. Four things about what godly discipline looks like. Um, four characteristics of godly discipline, you might say. Number one, A, it, it brings hope. Listen to Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Don't be a willing party to his death. Discipline brings hope. Your children, I want you to hear this this morning, your children are not a lost cause. They're not. There is hope for every single child that we raise up. No matter what stage you are in, there is hope for you and for your kids. So hear that. And we are not to stand by and just wait for our kids to find the path of life or death. That's not what we're supposed to do as parents. We're called to direct them to the path of life. It's our job, our God-ordained job, to lead them to the path of life. And there's a worldview issue here that is essential, I think, as we get into the scriptures. Proverbs 22:15 says this, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it away. The worldview issue is, is are our children inherently sinful or are they not? Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And the Bible tells us this over and over 
again. Our children are, they're amazing creatures. They are. They're created in the image and likeness of God. They're beautiful people. They're wonderful. But they are sinful. They're marred by sin. Foolishness is bound up in their heart. You you just need to spend a little time with a two- or three-year-old to to get this, right? Their first words are mine, me, Kira right now, me hungry, me thirsty, me this, me that. It is all about them. And this is a huge problem in our culture. We we simply encourage it rather than than point it out. Children, in in a lot of circumstances, I see a, a huge problem is children have become the gods of the family. Everything revolves around them. Everything revolves around their schedules, their activities, their needs, their desires. Just look at this time cover from last May. The me, me, me generation. Millennials are lazy, entitled narcissists who still live with their parents. The me generation, and this is so dangerous to to feed into that me-ness because it leads to destruction. It does. It doesn't lead to life. So we're called to, to correct, to teach our kids that the world does not revolve around them. And discipline does that. It brings hope that sin has been defeated. And we, when we point out sin and the heart of the issue, the heart of what's going on, and we don't focus just on behavior modification, but we focus on the heart of the issue. We bring hope into a child's life. Proverbs 22.6 says this, direct your children on the right path, and when they're older, they will not leave it. According to scholars, this is actually written as a warning, not a promise, like we may read it in English. It should read, Train up a child in his way, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in his way, in his selfish, uh, me way, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's a warning to us. We are called to direct, called to train, to be trainers. Have you ever seen a trainer, a physical trainer? Where are the bloomers? Are they in here? Yes, awesome. We got some trainers back there. They know how to train people. When you see people actually come alongside someone and train them, they are pushing them. Good trainers will come alongside and they will, they will correct. If, they're, if you're doing something wrong, you're doing you know, two bicep curls wrong and leaning into it, they're going to come, come and show you how to do it. They're going to train you to do it right. And then they're going to push you past your limits. They're going to challenge you and encourage you. And, and it's, not all, it's not all negative. It's positive, too. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to direct and to train our kids in the way of life. Discipline is about training. It's about positive correction for the purpose of restoration, not punishment. The purpose of restoration. So it brings hope. Secondly, God's discipline, or godly discipline allows for consequences, It allows for consequences. Let me read two verses out of Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. Whoever loves him is diligent. There's that word, to discipline him. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Once again, there's, there's scholars on, on both sides of what the rod actually is. Is it a shepherding rod or is it a beating rod? And, and, you know, I'm not here to argue that point with you today. But I think we can all agree on that there's consequences. Consequences are good. Negative and positive consequences are good. And we need to let our kids experience those negative and positive consequences. If we spare the rod of discipline, we're in a sense saying, I don't care about your life. If we, if we neglect consequences, that's what we're saying. We're saying there's a path that leads to life and there's a path that leads to death. And I want you so much to be on that path that leads to life. We can't shield ourselves from negative consequences. If we're always rescuing, 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 our kids will not be trained to know consequences. They will never learn to stand on their own. I need to remember for myself that I, I'm raising an adult. I'm not raising a child. I'm raising someone who I want to be an independent adult someday. And that helps me have perspective in that. 
The third thing, godly discipline imparts wisdom. Proverbs 29, 15. To discipline and reprimand a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. And then Proverbs 4, 1. My children, listen. When your father corrects you, pay attention and learn good judgment. Discipline is, is not just to punish. It's to impart wisdom. It's to teach. That's our job. You hear that? Get this. It's, it's a huge benefit to them. Discipline. It imparts wisdom. I think a lot of times, I, I know I feel this way, we parent our kids so that they're out of our way. We parent them rather than parent them for their benefit. We parent them so that they, they just are out of our, out of our hair and, and they have to go do something. We parent out of irritation. And when there's no irritation, we don't actually correct them. But we need to be diligent in this. Proverbs 23, 15, one more. I, I will rejoice if you become wise. A wise heart needs to be our goal as parents. A wise heart, not behavior modification, a wise heart. Nathan, this week, tried this one out on me. Um, and I'm, A lot of you parents have had this happen, but we were talking, and I asked him to do something. He said, you're not the boss of me. Oh, really? I said, actually, I am the boss of you. That was my response. Then my wife wisely chimed in, and she said, but it's not our job to boss you around. Our job is to direct and train you and instruct you. <laughs> so I was corrected in my parenting. Um, but uh, that's okay. We need to be teachable. We need to, I, I'm, I'm not the perfect parent, and, and I need to be taught how to parent. But I love this quote from Ted Tripp that touches on this. He said, the purpose of your authority in the lives of your kids is not to hold them under your power, but to empower them to be self-controlled people living freely under the authority of God. Let me read that one more time. The purpose of your authority is not to hold, in the lives of your kids, is not to hold them under your power, but it's to empower them to be self-controlled people living freely under the authority of God. That is a, a, a great thing to think about. And, and as we discipline, we impart wisdom to our kids so they can be self-controlled, so they can be under authority of God. I got to keep going. Last one. What does this godly discipline look like? It, it leads our children to know God. Proverbs 9.10 says this. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. And this question of what is the primary goal of, of your parenting is a huge one to think about. The primary goal of, of our parenting should not be to create nice, moral children. Children that make us look good at dinner parties. Children that, that get a good job. That's not the goal of our parenting. The goal of our parenting is to raise them and direct them so that they would have the best opportunity to know and to fear God because that is the path of life. We don't have control over their destiny, obviously, and what they will eventually choose about God. But we can discipline in a way that directs them, that leads them to know God. Because you know what? Our discipline is mimicking God. God says in Hebrews 12, I'm not going to read that passage, but you can go read it later. It's, it's all about how God disciplines us because he loves us. When we discipline our kids, we are expressing love to them, but we're also revealing what God is like to them and that he loves them. And so we're revealing that and, and godly discipline leads them to, to know God. So the last essential, if we're, we're diligent in our parenting, we, we learn to discipline in a godly way. Finally, it's uh, the word integrity of our own life. We need to understand the importance of integrity. And this one just really rocked me this week, thinking about this. Proverbs 27, the righteous walks in integrity. Blessed are his children after him. 
Don't you want your kids to be blessed? We're called to walk in integrity. You and I cannot parent from a do as I say, not as I do mentality. If we do that, our kids will grow up. They will think we are a joke. Integrity is so important. We need to be real. We need to be authentic. We need to be real with our questions, our struggles, our failures, obviously at appropriate times. And we need to model what we want to see in our kids, the kind of conversations we want them to have, the kind of relationship we want them to eventually have. We model that. Integrity is so important. Going back to that Deuteronomy 6 passage, it says, it, it, after impress these commands on your children, it said, these commands are to be on your hearts. They're to be on your minds. You're supposed to tie them on your doors, on your gates. It's about our life. Our integrity is so crucial. I think my favorite verse I came across this week was Proverbs 23, 26. It says, my son, give me your heart. Let your eyes observe my ways. You know, right now as a young parent, I just know I have the heart of my kids. And, you know, I'm, my kids are eight, six, and three, and you, you feel like you're a superhero to your kids. You can do no wrong sometimes as they interact with you, and they have given me their heart, and God has given me their heart so completely. And I have this opportunity to mold and to shape, and none of that, none of, none of my instruction or my lectures or anything like that will matter if I'm not living it out Observe my ways. Let your eyes observe my ways. Can we say that to our kids? Let your eyes observe my ways. Our life will speak far more than anything we can say. And I think Proverbs shares that with us. A young couple asked uh, Henry Blackaby, the guy who wrote Experiencing God, what advice he had for them as a young couple going into parenthood and he said this and I loved his quote he said let your walk with Jesus be so authentic and so vibrant that your children want to follow the God you follow without you having to say anything let it be so vibrant and so real that is our goal as parents that's the number one thing we got to focus on Couple questions as I finish up that you can think about. What's your takeaway this morning? What's the ultimate goal of your parenting? Is it to raise moral kids, to get them to have good jobs, go to a good school? Is it to make you look good? Or is the ultimate goal of your parenting to grow a child up in a way that they'll want to love and fear the Lord God? where life is really found. Second, what's your game plan for discipline? Have you thought about it? Is it intentional? Is it godly? Third, this question, do you, do you as a parent live a life of integrity? Are you modeling what you want to see in your kids? Fourth, this is for students or teenagers, don't forsake your parents' teaching. I pray that, that you recognize, if you're, if you're still under the authority of your parents, that they know better than you. I hope you can sense that and recognize that and live in that and honor your parents. Maybe if you're not a parent in here, if you're single or if you're an empty nester or if you're, um, you know, waiting to have kids or whatever stage you're in, I pray that you recognize that God takes parenting very seriously. I pray that you get a glimpse today of how God parents us, that he is loving, that he's diligent in the mundaneness of life. He walks with us every step of the way, that he allows consequences, that he imparts wisdom as he disciplines, 
that he teaches us to love and know him, and he embodies integrity. God is the, the model of integrity. And so I hope you see God in all of this. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word and just how it speaks. I know as a parent, I feel so inadequate and um, untrained and just, God, I need your wisdom. We need your wisdom. I pray that your voice would be strong, would be the strongest voice we listen to as we go through this journey of parenting. And I pray for each parent in this place that they would sense that they're not alone, that there is a family around them right now that's encouraging them, that's lifting them up in prayer, that's coming alongside of them. And I pray that we sense that in this church, that this would be a place where, where parents are encouraged, built up, to hang in there, to be diligent. And so we thank you that you've not left us to our own resources, but you've given us your spirit and your body and your family to parent Would you speak to us as we go through the trenches this week and uh, continue to walk this journey together? We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. We're going to take.